And I've put this uh, talk together called Images of the Cosmos, and it covers with some lovely images a lot of different aspects of astronomy. And I've tried to select what I think are the most iconic images that really tell us a story about our existence, our place in the universe. And uh, so we're going to work our way through these slides and they're just my personal choice of many many fantastic photographs but I think they tell a bit of a story and the, the title slide here is a picture of course of the Horsehead Nebula which is in the constellation of Orion just below the left hand star of Orion's belt rather difficult to observe I've managed to image it myself from my uh, home observatory but then I've got you know really all the toys whereas a normal amateur telescope it's almost impossible to find because the uh, faint pink light that you see there really is very faint and certainly I've never managed to observe it visually because your eye is not very sensitive to those colors but uh, with modern equipment and modern telescopes and the advent of the digital photography it's amazing what we can now do and present these images. So here we go, images of the cosmos. Well, I think the first one that I'm going to uh, want to show you is this one, Earthrise, taken by Apollo. It was Apollo 8 that was the first uh, time that man had ventured beyond the moon and gone into orbit around the far side of the moon. So the first time that human eyes had set uh, directly their gaze on the far side of the moon but I think it wasn't the moon that they discovered most uh, iconically it was the reappearance of the earth shown here apart from the three people on board the spacecraft the entirety of the rest of humanity was hidden from them until the blue white marble of the earth rose above the lunar landscape there as they swung round the moon and, and the earth swung back into view again and I think that's absolutely amazing they said you could hold your thumb out in front of your eye and block out the whole of the rest of humanity and it just showed how uh, amazingly small the earth is and how fragile it is Following on then, this photograph of Buzz Aldrin's footprint on the moon. This is often shown, but it's not the first footprint that went on the moon. This is a test footprint that uh, Buzz did deliberately, he stepped forward, put his foot down hard and stepped back and photographed it. Specifically show that the uh, depth and the, um, of the imprint of his boot could be measured and of course they do that by measuring the length of the shadows and knowing the angle of the sun based on astronomy they could work out how deep the ridges and the imprint of his boot was and therefore know things about the uh, strength of the lunar soil so it was a very iconic photograph and meant a lot but really it was also a science experiment so it's often the case that uh, the story behind the story is more interesting than uh, perhaps you might imagine. And of course, this probably got rubbed out when the Apollo 11 spacecraft took off, when the uh, ascent stage of the lunar module blasted off, probably threw dust around with its rocket exhaust that would have perhaps rubbed out quite a few of these footprints. So a couple of pictures of the moon there and of course that's a good place to start because it's our nearest neighbour. So I'll try and talk over this but I think this is amazing that we have images like this of the boiling activity of the sun. You normally think of the sun as being a fairly quiescent and calm object always the same every day but our knowledge of what goes on on the sun has expanded so much with the advent of space telescopes 
and producing images like this of a solar flare throwing material out across space. Here it is again, a full disc image. And of course, one of the things that results from that is the Northern Lights. And this is a fantastic picture of the full glory of the Northern Lights over a Norwegian field with the pine forests in the background and a little bit of cloud and even some of the lights are showing through the cloud they're that bright and you have that characteristic green color and above it the uh, deeper purple color there and it's even bright enough to reflect in the in the lake now if you want to know more about the northern lights that's actually going to be the subject of my saturday matinee talk tomorrow i'm going to go into full details about how the northern lights come to be and why they're where they are when the best time to observe them is and show lots more really nice images of exactly what you can see and i went up north uh, twice last year and was lucky enough to see the same uh, solar storm produce the northern lights on two occasions exactly one solar rotation apart because uh, it's the solar storms sending their material straight across the gap between the sun and the earth and they hit the atmosphere that causes these amazing phenomena. But the full story of that tomorrow. This is a picture that I took and it's the transit of Venus taken in 2004 at around about nine o'clock in the morning. Venus was crossing in front of the disk of the sun. So you see the full disk of the sun there and the little black circle to the bottom is the uh, disk of Venus creating a miniature eclipse, a partial eclipse of the Sun. Now we call these transits and of course it's only the inner two planets, Mercury and Venus, that can cause these. Although they have actually used some of the space rovers out on Mars to observe the Earth transiting across the face of the Sun. You've got a little sunspot, a couple of them right in the center of the sun's disk there, but back in 2004, 16 years ago, the uh, sun was very quiet, not very many sunspots at all. And it's at the same stage now. And again, more about that tomorrow. But the real striking feature of this image here is that Venus is about the same size as the Earth. And it just shows you how enormous the sun is in comparison to the tiny little planets that uh, we inhabit in the form of Earth and Venus, about 8,000 miles across each. Now here is a atmosphere picture of Venus. We're seeing the cloud tops and Venus's atmosphere is so thick as we've heard in other parts of the Introduction to Astronomy course, that with normal telescopes from Earth, we can't see anything except for these amazingly thick clouds. The atmospheric pressure on Venus is around about 100 bar, about 100 times the pressure that it is on Earth. And the temperature at the surface is 450 degrees C, which means the density of that atmosphere is almost like soup. Um, to have that much pressure and that much temperature, you need an enormously massive atmosphere. Um, so even uh, walking through it would be uh, very difficult indeed, uh, except for the fact that you'd have other issues like being crushed by the pressure, burnt by the temperature and dissolved by the rain of sulfuric acid falling out of the sky. So it's not a place to book your next holiday. But of course we can see through the clouds if we use other wavelengths of electromagnetic radiation and in particular this is a radar image the long wave radio waves are able to penetrate the clouds and bounce back to the spacecraft that was in orbit round venus and produce this 3d map in false color so low-lying regions are colored blue and then green yellow red and the highest regions are white so you have these amazing features with this long belt of sinuous 
ridges and mountains around the equator on the high ground and then the lowlands the low-lying regions are more northerly and southerly and uh, i want you to remember that when we have a little look in a minute at uh, mars but just staying with venus this is one of the very few photographs we have of the surface of venus taken by the russian probe venera 13. The Russians tried quite a few times to drop landers through down to the surface of Venus but due to that pressure and the temperature and the acid rain and everything most of them didn't survive at all and in fact even the best ones and in particular Venera 13 only managed to send back a few photographs before their systems failed. There's an arm sticking out there, which is a sort of arm sampler to test the soil a bit. And the other strange piece of equipment on the ground is the lens cap from the camera that's been ejected to, in order to take this uh, rather uh, barren looking landscape shot. And everything looks very foreshortened due to that thick density of the atmosphere that we've talked about just now. And moving on then, Mars, and I love this photograph, although there's one thing missing, it's not showing the polar ice caps at the, at the top, it's uh, actually just showing the uh, North Pole of Mars right at the top there, and the South Pole where the ice happened to be at this time is uh, hidden behind the tipped over aspect that we're looking at. But what it does show very nicely is the enormous gash in the ground running centre to uh, the uh, right hand side there. That's Valles Marinaris, the enormous Martian Grand Canyon. And you can see all the little side canyons running into it. And this really was carved by water, uh, water running off the highland plains in down the little box canyons into the main enormous uh, rift valley and then out into the uh, seas of Mars two and a half to three billion years ago when Mars was a warm wet planet like the Earth. You can also see over to the centre left the three volcanoes in a row and the even bigger volcano in the background there that's uh, um, Olympus Mons and this is the Tharsis Plateau where a lot of the volcanic activity seemed to be concentrated on Mars. But of course we've got rovers on the surface so we have fantastic pictures like this. Um, we've got two photographs here. Top right is an orbiter photograph looking down on Victoria Crater which has got those sand dunes in the bottom there. And at about uh, nine or about ten o'clock on the clock face of that crater there's a little bay there you can see a nice little curved inlet and that's Duck Bay as it's called and the rover is sat taking a picture looking at the outcrops of rock in the edge of Duck Bay there and you can see we've got different rocks layered uh, rocks and cracked vertical columns of rock so there's obviously been different sources of uh, Martian geology there and the layered rocks are absolutely looking just like they would do on earth if they were laid down in a liquid environment as sediment on the bottom of uh, some ancient ocean and of course that's entirely what we believe. And this is some fantastic uh, evidence for that on Mars. What we have at the top is the whole of the disk of Mars unwrapped onto a, uh, a rectangular area and you can see again this is a radar altimeter map so the deepest blue is the lowest lying and bottom left there is the huge deep hole in the ground the Hellas Basin where an enormous impactor smashed into Mars and uh, created a giant crater a big hole in the ground they ejected lots of material a very long time ago and there's a, another similar but smaller crater over to the lower uh, right of that image. The high ground is, is the pink with the white caps being the peaks of those three volcanoes again and set off to the left of the three is again Olympus Mons, the largest volcano in the solar system. 
and you can see how Valles Marinaris and its box canyons run away from that highland plateau where the volcanoes are and down out towards the lowlands and you can even see some other channels running into that bay which is leading out into the northern blue area. Now I want you to look at this and say look uh, at the number of craters that there are on the different regions. Cratering happens more or less these days at a constant rate and so the number of craters is an indication of how long it has been since the land was covered over by geology uh, creating either mudslides or erosion or volcanic eruptions or some other process. And you can see that the, all the medium and highlands in the bottom half of Mars there are peppered in craters with the exception of the Hellas Basin the other crater over on the right there that doesn't have any baby craters in the middle of it and the Tharsis Plateau where the volcanoes are and all of the blue at the top well there are one or two craters up there but not very many and this tells us what's how to put all of this together starting with the high ground the Tharsis Plateau has had its craters rubbed out by the volcanic activity of those three enormous volcanoes plus the others that you can see Olympus Mons the one that's not quite so high uh, above that and to the right and then there's another white tipped one left of center on the image there that's also similarly surrounded by a region where there are no craters so that's lava flows from the volcanoes erasing evidence of cratering what about the large deep blue areas well that's because they were water for billions of years and they were the northern ocean and then the Hellas Basin was full of water a bit like the Dead Sea and perhaps the other light blue crater to the bottom right was also full of water and so any craters that uh, or any meteors falling in would have had to get through the water first of all and of course that will absorb a lot of the energy and then if they did try and punch a hole in the ground then uh, it would soon be filled up again by silt and a lot of that silt into the northern ocean is being delivered by the erosion of the Tharsis Plateau being washed down Valles Marinaris so you can see the whole weather cycle of it raining on the highlands and washing down the uh, canyons out into the sea there you can see it all in that one picture and we've got bottom right in the brown colored picture evidence of water flowing in braided river channels on the surface of Mars from a very long time ago one or two little craters on top of that which helps us age it and those braided river channels are characteristic of uh, where water is flowing when there is no vegetation to protect the banks we see it in barren areas like Greenland and Svalbard and other places where there are no trees because they trees tend to stabilize the banks and you get one meandering river rather than these braided channels so this is telling us that although there might have been water on Mars there wasn't much by way of advanced life at the time doesn't mean there weren't microbes and algae they would have been uh, unaffecting of the uh, structure of the river and to the bottom left there we've got a meteor impact on the surface of Mars that's very very fresh just to prove that uh, these things do still happen who remembers this comet hail bop back in the late 90s it was visible by uh, for months on end and I think three quarters of the population of the earth could see it during that time absolutely spectacular with its uh, bright white dust tail and the blue ion tail where the charged particles that are being blasted off it by the solar wind the same thing that causes the aurora is at work here ripping bits of uh, gas molecules apart ionizing them and then the sun's magnetic field is deflecting the charged particles into a tail that goes in a different direction to the main tail which is just being carried uh, by the uh, momentum of the solar wind 
directly away from the sun, whereas the magnetic field is deflected slightly. And a more recent picture of a comet is this one, Comet Gerasim Co. Uh, Chernimernov, uh, 67P, it's a lot easier to say. And this uh, looks like a, a toy duck in this image here, where the heat of the sun is causing enormous amounts of material being vented off out, which is coming off this nucleus of the comet and will form that uh, coma around it and the bright tail. You can really see how the jets of material are bursting forth from the uh, hot spots created by uh, the heat of the sun. And the shape of it is very interesting as well. It's a contact binary. It's two objects that have gravitated together and just nudged into each other and perhaps made a, a small amount of debris fly around. And then some of it's resettled and kind of cemented the two together. So uh, it's a contact binary. We see quite a lot of these in asteroids and uh, other outer solar system objects as well. But who, who can remember comet Schumacher-Levy 9 being shredded from a single comet by the gravity of Jupiter? It came too close to Jupiter, was torn apart, and then the many fragments all crashed into Jupiter one after another, creating that row of black smoke rings on the atmosphere of the gas giant planet. I think that's just incredible. And the image on the right in orange there is an infrared image taken by the uh, Galileo spacecraft looking at Jupiter. And you can see the heat signature of a couple of the enormous explosions there where the comet fragments smashed into the atmosphere and released the energy of quite a large nuclear bomb each. The pale red thing is, is the great red spot. In fact, it's not one of the impacts, but it's the brighter two that are the uh, impacts of comets. Looking at the great red spot, this is a fantastic uh, Hubble picture of Jupiter and the changes over time from 1995 to 2014, uh, three different snapshots of the Great Red Spot, all taken with the wide failed planetary camera. Uh, in fact, some of them are the WFC3, the first one in 95 is the Mark II camera. So that was then replaced by a servicing mission. But the incredible detail on the atmosphere of Jupiter with its swirling clouds is just amazing. But star of the show really for the uh, Jupiter region has got to be the moon Io with its enormous volcanoes. You can see a couple of them in a couple of shots there throwing material up into space that's being backlit. So we can see at the top right and bottom right there some active volcanoes going off on the surface of Io. The main image of Io in the middle looks like a pizza, it's covered in sulphur. Everything is sulphur there. The, the red is sulphur, the yellow is sulphur, the white is sulphur, and so is the black. Uh, if you ever remember chemistry at school, if you cool sulphur at different speeds, um, then it forms different uh, versions of itself, different allotropes. The molecules get together in a different way, and you get these four different colors. You can do it in the lab. And then we've got a little insert at the bottom there of a, a lava volcano with the runny sulphur lava on the surface of Io, the most volcanic moon in the solar system. Second moon out is Europa, orbits around Jupiter a little bit further away than Io, absolutely covered in an ice layer, which is cracked and grooved, and somehow through the grooves is oozing up to the surface organic material that we see as this brown mixture of chemicals. And it's, because it's a complicated mixture, we haven't managed to decipher its spectral fingerprint yet and work out exactly what it's made of. But we know that there is water coming up with it. We can see the water venting into space. Again, on the image at the right there, you can see some jets of water vapor coming from the surface of uh, Europa and they align with exactly where the cracks are that are seen in the main image. 
we think there's an ocean underneath the ice there's many kilometers of ice and then more water on Europa than there is in all the oceans on earth underneath it and then a rocky core right in the center and so this is a number one candidate for a livable habitat for some form of life and it was in the news just the other day uh, with NASA talking about how highly probable it is they think that there must be some form of life in there possibly accounting for that brown material that may be the remains of European life forms or algae like creatures being brought to the surface there that live deep, deeper down in or under the ice. Moving out to Saturn, of course, we have Saturn with its rings and in, in glorious detail here, they've arranged for the spacecraft to go behind the planet and create this backlit effect. And uh, the disk of the planet is blocking out the sun. So the rings are scattering the light forwards to us. And that allows you to see the immense detail of all the individual ringlets within the main ring structures and reveals some of the more ghostly dusty rings further out but there's a little tiny speck there halfway from the center to the edge midline um, on the left little tiny dot and that is you and me and the whole population of the earth and nasa publicized that they were going to take this photograph beforehand it's called the day the earth smiled because they asked everyone to turn their face up to the heavens at a particular time and smile for the camera. Now, of course, most people would have been pointing in the wrong direction, but nevertheless, the idea is exactly that. There it is, a little arrow to highlight it for you. Incredible photograph taken by the Cassini spacecraft. More from that mission. This is an image taken by radar down through the clouds of the moon Titan, one of the largest moons in the solar system, orbits around Saturn, and it's bigger even than the planet Mercury, and has an atmosphere that's one and a half times the pressure of our own atmosphere, much more material in it at a low temperature, minus 160 degrees. We can't see through the surface, but we can again penetrate it with radar. And this is an image of the Kraken Mare, a lake on the surface of Titan. And you can see the rivers running into the lake that replenish it from the land all around. Looks very, very Earth-like. But at minus 160 degrees centigrade, all the water is frozen up hard as steel. So the liquid that is doing the flowing here and filling the lake is liquid methane. Natural gas is methane on Earth. We use that for our cooking and heating. Um, but at these temperatures, it's a liquid. And so Titan has liquid methane rain, rivers. It even has methane snow on the high ground. All of the features of the earthly hydrological cycle of uh, the flow of water, the evaporation from the lakes in the summer, the lakes dry out, the rain falls somewhere else. All of that's been observed on Titan by the Cassini mission. And again, this is another candidate for NASA. They want to make a mission to go with another lander that will parachute down onto Titan, but they want to send it as a multi-part lander. They want to send a main lander. They want a... Uh, submarine that they can drop into the Kraken Mare and go and explore what's going on uh, beneath the surface and also want to take a quadricopter drone so they can fly around without having to drive around on the surface and explore the uh, Titan in more detail. Also the Cassini mission at Saturn took this fantastic picture of the North Pole of Saturn with the giant polar vortex, which creates this weird hexagonal arrangement. And of course, you've got the rings and the shadow of the rings, a uh, shadow of the planet on the rings there. Here's the polar vortex in a bit more detail, a couple of images, one of which is animated, showing how it changes all the time. 
and it has this weird hexagonal uh, effect. This is just a consequence of uh, the way that fluid dynamics works in a rotating sphere. We can simulate this sort of thing with a giant ball of liquid in the uh, laboratory and you get the same effect with six vortices surrounding one central one uh, forming if you get conditions just right. Quite incredible pictures though. Out here the real surprise was the little moon Enceladus only 500 kilometers across this orbits around Saturn and what they were expecting as we always do when we find these rather ordinary looking moons to have a cratered surface but no this one has got an ice covering there's a vague impact crater at the top there that's almost been rubbed out but all the rest of the cratering has been erased by a constant resurfacing and then you have the blue cracks across the grooves there the so-called tiger stripes and the image inset at the top right shows how the tiger stripes are venting water into space again just like Europa Enceladus has an ice crust with a liquid ocean underneath and it's probably number two on the list of probable inhabited worlds of the solar system uh, inhabited by microbes uh, of some sort perhaps and we suspect that quite strongly because they organized to fly the Cassini mission back through the plume that we've got the photograph of there and sample it and they found it contained water which wasn't a surprise but it contained organic molecules uh, some sort of organic soup which was hard to analyze and also molecular hydrogen and molecular hydrogen is one of the things that you would expect to find if there were uh, bacterial like creatures living on the rock water interface using the metals and the minerals uh, to uh, do metabolism and giving off hydrogen as one of their waste products so that's uh, quite possible that that's what's going on on Enceladus some of the other moons of Saturn and the rings are absolutely fantastic We've got bottom left there, you've got um, Hyperion, which looks like a bath bomb made of bath salts. It's pros possibly a captured comet, and all of those uh, uh, are vents where uh, the material is vent was vented out into space, uh, rather as we saw with uh, Comet 67P. To the bottom right, we've got Iapetus, another large moon of Saturn which looks like it's been glued together as two halves. Um, actually, we think that ridge around its equator might be the remains of a ring system that Iapetus had around it that has rained out and fallen out along its equator. But there are several other theories and we're not entirely sure. Dead center or just off center there is the Death Star Moon. That's Mimas, which has that enormous crater named after Herschel on it. Classic crater with a rim and a central peak. But if that had been much larger as an impactor object, it would have probably destroyed Mimas. If you get to the point where the crater is more than about 25% the diameter of the target object, usually the object gets fractured. And then the top left and right, we've got images of structure within the rings. At the top there you've got shadows of bits of the ring falling on other flatter areas of the ring showing that spiky shadow pattern showing the 3D structure of some of the bits of the outer part of that ring where it's a little bit unstable. And then at the top left we've got the little moon Daphnis orbiting round in its own gap in one of the rings and disturbing the ring particles using its gravity as it goes around, creating that waves of disruption in the outer part of the ring there. Absolutely incredible details. Voyager 2, of course, the only spacecraft to visit uh, the outer two planets. Here's Uranus, and it's got some cloud features on it, and even its own somewhat weedy rings. Saturn is not the only planet to have rings. Indeed, Jupiter also has a, a ring system 
as do Uranus and indeed Neptune. They're nowhere near as spectacular as those of Saturn. And then we have the little moon Miranda. And Miranda looks like it's rather jumbled up. It's got that chevron shape of white material, that's ice, and then some darker rock, and it looks a little bit like somebody has smashed at least the bottom half of Europa into lots of large chunks, and then they've come back together, and it's as if the jigsaw's not been put back together quite right. And indeed, that's what we think probably happened to it. It probably did have a giant impact with another body that was almost a match for it and shattered it and then it's re-accreted by gravity but it wasn't totally blown to smithereens and so you've got this mixed terrain and right down at the bottom there the shadows show some enormous cliffs in a great gash in the ground and those are about four kilometers high great place to go base jumping if you could get to Miranda and jump off the cliffs there you'd have four kilometers to fall but because of the very weak gravity of a little moon like this, it would take hours for you to fall and you'd hit the ground really rather gently. So it'd be quite spectacular. And of course, the iconic image, the flyby image of Neptune taken by Voyager 2 here. We've got the great dark spot, rather like the great red spot on Jupiter. But here is Neptune blue in colour because there's a lot more methane in the atmosphere here rather than the hydrogen and helium that uh, we find at Jupiter and Saturn. Also some ammonia and other icy uh, materials and a few white spots down there as well that moved quite quickly. The uh, winds on Neptune are the fastest in the solar system despite it being so far from the sun um, and is managing to trap enough heat to generate winds of 1100 miles an hour. So amazing speed. But the real surprise at the Neptunian system was its large moon Triton. We didn't get very much data because we just had the one flyby of it, but we got this photograph and this shows how complex the terrain is. At the top there, it looks like the surface of a wrinkled melon with some grooves running across it, reminiscent of the grooves on Europa. And there's some sort of frosting there and then towards the bottom we've got pink snow which is uh, nitrogen ice snow that has frozen out at minus 220 degrees centigrade so far from the sun are we and then we've got these black things the black stains on the ground but you notice they're all pointing in the same direction when you look at them and they're all pointing downwind of their point of origin Triton has a little bit of an atmosphere of nitrogen and it's able to create these downwind trajectories for what are the tops of liquid nitrogen geysers erupting from beneath. So here, rather than having methane replace water, as is the case at Saturn, here nitrogen is forming as snow and taking the hydrological cycle even to the point of forming geysers and uh, effectively hot springs on the surface of Triton although they're not very hot they're minus 200 degrees quite incredible that there's any activity this far from the sun and of course we mustn't forget poor old Pluto dwarf planet status these days and this really surprised when the New Horizons space probe finally visited it for a flyby in 2015. We got these amazing pictures of the surface of Pluto with an enormous glacier there at the bottom right that seems to be moving across the surface, erasing craters as it goes. And there are some channels and grooves. And we're really tr still trying to understand why there is any geological activity on this little world so far from the sun what is the source of energy it must be some sort of radioactive heating inside the the little um, dwarf planet or something that's generating heat in the core or possibly that pluto might have had an enormous impact uh, maybe 250 to 500 million years ago 
and become completely molten again um, and therefore was reheated in its core and is still trying to lose that heat out through geological activity. And that's a possibility and it points to a coincidence that Triton and Pluto look very similar and it could be that the Pluto system was created from a body and that body also created Triton and somehow Neptune was involved in capturing Triton and throwing Pluto and its moons into a slightly different orbit but we're not sure. Talking of uh, Pluto this is a fantastic colorized image again with that enormous glacier there with all the structure to it one or two impact craters um, and the colors indicate the minerals or materials we've got frozen methane frozen water nitrogen frost and then the glacier is a mixture of frozen carbon monoxide methane and nitrogen so all sorts of interesting chemistry going on potentially as well and whilst i'm not completely convinced it's possible that the uh, might be again a warm enough liquid environment underneath the surface of Pluto especially if it's geologically young having undergone that recent remelting enough for that chemistry to start doing some of the precursor activities to the formation of life even and this is a lovely shot of Pluto's large moon Charon so large that the two orbit each other around a common center of mass and again nobody expected Sharon to have anything other than a purely cratered surface yet it too looks young and it also has that brown organic material on its polar region at the top there so this is definitely worth investigating some more so let's move on further out a fantastic image of some stars here and we've talked about the stars how many there are, the distances to them, and what we know, and why they have the colors and brightnesses they do. But this po photograph captures just how many of them there are, and the diversity very nicely. Here's a few shots that are worth mentioning. Um, the top two I took, the top right is Betelgeuse in Orion, and the top left is a double star called Alberio, the beak of Cygnus the Swan and you can see the pair of stars there one is a uh, slightly yellowy white color in this image and the other one is a nice blue color blue means hot and hot usually means massive and massive usually means burns through fuel at a tremendous rate and therefore not very old but here we can see that the blue star is smaller and fainter than the uh, cooler companion star that's only just orangey white and so there's a bit of a conundrum as to the ages of these because you would expect that the uh, brighter star would be the larger one and it would have the higher temperature but it's the other way around here um, but the latest news is that perhaps they're not actually related they're just passing each other in space they might not be a binary system at all and therefore perhaps this could explain this uh, apparent paradox now the two images at the bottom are the highest resolution images of stars ever the one at the bottom left is the star that we see as capella in the sky northern sky it's always above the horizon from cambridge and we name our newsletter for the cambridge astronomical association capella after it but capella is a double star made of these two orangey yellow stars in orbit around each other but they're so close together that nobody had been able to image them until this picture and this was taken using the coast telescope down at Lord's Bridge on the radio astronomy site but it's an optical telescope using separate mirrors that could be placed up to 50 meters apart and then bringing the light from those separate mirrors together on an underground optics bench 
to give you a simulated effect of the precision of a 50 meter diameter mirror, um, even though you've actually only got two one meter mirrors. And this was the first time they'd managed to do this optical interferometry and see Capella as two separate stars. They also took the photograph on the right there, which is a picture of Betelgeuse. My image is at the top, the coast image is at the bottom, and it actually shows the real size of the disk of this red giant star, um, and even that it's a little bit wonky looking. Uh, so quite a fascinating to see a star other than the sun as something other than a point of light. But no tour of the images of the cosmos could uh, go through without showing you the Orion Nebula, the stellar nursery where stars are being born all the time out of a collapsed cloud of gas and dust, lit up by the blue light of the hot young stars that have been formed in the middle of it and creating those, those blue effect to the clouds. The pink effect on the clouds is where the ultraviolet light from the stars is ionizing hydrogen and causing hydrogen to fluoresce, just like the gas in a fluorescent light fitting does, give out the characteristic color of hydrogen. And then we've got the dark dust lanes, which are the uh, denser regions that are left that are still forming new stars. And of course, this image, the pillars of creation in the Eagle Nebula, taken by the Hubble. This is probably the iconic Hubble Space Telescope picture of all time. And it shows these enormous columns, light years in length, in which new stars and new solar systems are being born, while the bright blue light from some of the stars out of shot above here that have formed earlier is boiling away the tips of the uh, columns. Now you can see they're outgassing, giving off vapor in every direction due to the radiation from the stars. But the columns themselves then provide their own shadow to the deeper parts of the column, uh, sacrificially protecting the denser regions where a collapse to new stars is still forming. Here's a solar system in formation. The star Formaholt, they took this image using a coronagraph, blotting out the central star and looking to see if they could find planets or anything orbiting around it. That sort of strange black shape with the white dot is the apparatus blocking out the central star. And it's revealed a dust ring, which is uh, around, orbiting around the star. And in the inset, they took two images of um, a po probable planet forming out of that dust, taken two years apart. But just recently, they've gone back and re-imaged it, and that planet has gone, probably destroyed within a giant impact. And uh, this is part of the story of planets. You have to be a, the lucky survivors of all of the... Uh, game of cosmic billiards that goes on in these forming solar systems to end up not being destroyed and surviving as one of the last few planets. Also out in uh, talking about star forming, after you've had a uh, star forming region like the Orion Nebula, you uh, blow away all of the remaining gas due to the uh, radiation coming from the hot young stars until you form a new star cluster. And here is the seven sisters, the Pleiades, in this fantastic image, hot young blue stars dominating the image. But there are hundreds of lesser stars in the image as well. The nature is very good at forming small stars, not so good at forming large ones. It's hard to get enough material together before the star lights up and switches off the infalling of any more material by blowing it away. And here we can see the uh, last remaining wisps of gas surrounding this new star cluster with maybe 500 stars in it. But the other end of the star forming process, or the, the life of stars, the life cycle, is 
the death throes. And all of these images here are sun-like stars of various masses that have reached the end of their life and then gone through the red giant phase, which will be their last gasp, and then puffed off their outer atmospheres out into space, leaving behind a little dead nuclear core called a white dwarf. You can see the little tiny white speck in the middle of most of them. That's the white dwarf, the dead nuclear reactor from the core of the star. But they're seeding the cosmos with the elements that go on to then fall back together millions of years later into new solar systems and new planets. And you can look at these amazingly beautiful colour pictures, but the colours tell the story of what elements have been made. The red and pink is usually hydrogen, the green is carbon and oxygen, the yellow is carbon, some of the blues are nitrogens, and some of the other more exotic elements are also present as well, depending on uh, how large a star it was, all the way up to elements like neon and magnesium and sodium and things like that. So some of the quite interesting chemistry gets born in these uh, low mass stars up to 10 and a half times the mass of the sun. Uh, anything bigger than that dies a different death. Here's an example. This is Supernova 1987A, and it's not in our galaxy. It's in one of our satellite dwarf galaxies called the Large Magellanic Cloud, 160,000 light years away. And it blew up, and we detected the light flash from it, and you can see it ejecting the uh, enormous shock waves out as the star exploded at the very end of its life collapsing down, probably formed a neutron star, and then material from the explosion fell back onto the neutron star, tipped it over the maximum mass of a neutron star, the tolman oppenheimer volkov limit of around about two and a half solar masses, and it collapsed to a black hole. And uh, it's a very beautiful image, and we learned a lot about supernovae from the study of the light and the gamma rays and even some of the neutrino particles were detected from this even though it's so far away. This object looks like a supernova or a planetary nebula but it's actually neither of them. This object V838 Monocerotis is a light echo Here is a picture of it again and a sequence down the side of a flare-up that it had. What we have is a very large star called a Wolf-Rayet star, one of the largest stars to form, about a hundred solar masses. They don't really come much bigger than about 250 solar masses, maybe 300 absolute tops. So this is a monster star and it's such a big star with such a high thermal output and high temperature that it has blown away its entire hydrogen envelope. So all that is left is the helium core directly exposed. And all of the rest of the outer envelope surrounds this star in an expanding disk and sphere of gas. But every now and again, the star has an enormous outburst of activity and it's rather like a photographic flash going off and we saw the photographic flash the enormous brightening and dimming quite quickly in a, in a very short period of time as an eruption occurred on this star and then as we studied it we saw the pictures on the left with the outside of it appearing to get bigger as we've gone through from May 2002 to February of 2004. But this is not an expanding shell of gas. This is actually the light bouncing off different shells within the gas at different times. And the light travels 
the initial flash travelled straight towards us and arrived first, but then the light that went sideways and hit the innermost shell of gas took some time to do that and then bounced off it and came to us. And so it arrived later. And then the next shell of gas, well, it took a little bit longer for the light to go sideways, hit that layer and then come to us. And so each of those layers is being lit up in turn by the pulse of light. Because when we measured how fast this image seemed to be expanding, it's expanding at the speed of light because it is not the material that's moving. It's the flash of light coming back to us off different layers of the uh, material. Quite incredible. And here is a, a supernova imposter. This is Eta Carina, another giant star. This has erupted as if it's going to blow up as a supernova on more than one occasion. And this amazing Hubble image shows how there have been a number of eras of eruption. And we think it is trying to explode as a supernova, but it's somehow failing and the material is falling back on it and it's having another go. And it's due perhaps to have another third attempt in uh, recorded history at exploding anytime soon. So this is a candidate for a, a visible supernova. Of course, one that we did see is the Crab Nebula. This was visible in the year 1054 AD, where an enormous star exploded outwards as a supernova and left behind a spinning neutron star right in the center, as illustrated by this animation here, that's showing the effect of it expanding away and then morphs into showing you the uh, neutron star by bringing in some x-ray photograph data there and overlaying it. And you see the dot of the central spinning neutron star in the middle. You see that again in this image. Again, we've got an optical and an x-ray image overlaid and just the x-ray image on the right. So here we have a, a neutron star, the collapsed core of a giant star with the density of an atomic nucleus and about 10 kilometers in diameter but weighing as much as twice the mass of the sun, spinning 30 times a second. It's quite a violent uh, environment, enormous magnetic field generated, and a jet of material that you can see being spun off the spin axis of the uh, neutron star there in that right-hand X-ray image. The gas producing that is about a million degrees, so it's an incredibly violent place. We've recorded the pulses of radio coming off the neutron star and you can see in the image here, you can see the flashing light of the beam of energy coming our way repeatedly. You can see the flash turning on and off there. But if you want to hear the radio waves turned into sound, here they are. So each click is one rotation of the neutron star. Now this is a animation, it's a, actually an artist's impression. It's one of the few that I am going to show you that's not a real image. I will always tell you if it's not a real image. And this is the merger of two black holes. And I put this in because not so much for the image, because it's artificial, but for the sound that was recorded when an event like this, this is supposed to depict, was detected. And if I get my button clicking correct, I need the mouse pointer for this. This is the sound of two black holes merging. You have to wait for it. There it is. Shall we have that again? I'll keep the mouse pointer so you can see the progress. So here comes the sound of two black holes merging. It gets higher in pitch and louder as time goes on. 
There it goes. That chirp was detected by the LIGO Laser Interferometer Gravity Wave Observatory experiment. That is the noise of two black holes, a 20 solar mass and a 30 solar mass black hole merging. But a real uh, set of images here, these are stars orbiting the giant black hole in the middle of our galaxy, which is located where the little red X is handily being placed in the diagram. But from the orbits of these stars, we can use Kepler's laws and Newton's laws of gravity to work out exactly what the mass is at the center. And it's 3.8 million times the mass of our sun in an invisible unseen object that can only be a supermassive black hole right at the center there. I get my uh, students to use those mathematical rules to work out the mass there from the different orbits of those stars. Um, it's a relatively straightforward calculation. So let's look even further afield now at some of the best images from outside of our Milky Way galaxy. First though, there's the Milky Way above the VLT observatories in Chile. And this is a fantastic image of our galaxy. You can see the central bulge up there just underneath the title and the dark dust lanes stretching either side of it where the spiral arms are. We of course can't see our galaxy from outside, uh, we just don't have the ability to travel out and look back, it's too far, but we see other galaxies and this is one of my favourites, this is the Whirlpool Galaxy, absolutely fantastic image of the main galaxy and its dwarf companion over there on the left that is being torn apart by the powerful gravity of the main system and a little star bridge between the two has formed and uh, lots of stars being thrown everywhere, lots of new star forming activity. When we look at this image we can see how the spiral arms are blue with pink bits embedded in them. Those pink bits, each of them is like the Orion Nebula. It's a star nursery where it's new stars are being formed out of the collapse of gas and if you look they're all embedded within the thread-like structure of the dark dust lanes that fill the spiral arms. You, if you trace the path of the dark dust lanes you keep coming across the pink star forming regions which have kicked off new uh, star cluster creation. And then the rest of the spiral arms well they contain lots and lots of hot young blue stars but blue stars are hot stars they burn very fast and so they soon die out and so again this is a sign that recent star formation has occurred whereas deep in the core of the galaxy it's a different color entirely here there have not been any new stars formed for a while so all the blue ones have burned out leaving only the yellow and orange and maybe a few of the white ones left and the white ones will burn out next. Here's a galaxy, Centaurus A, that has got a feeding black hole in the centre. And that black holes are very messy eaters. Material spirals down inside them and then gets torn apart. And some of it gets caught up in the magnetic field and shot out along the north and south magnetic fields of these uh, amazing objects and creates these enormous lobes that you can see either side of the main ring of the galaxy there. The antennae galaxies here as the result of galaxy mergers, we talked about this in the introduction to astronomy course and here two spiral galaxies have come close to each other and thrown off enormous tidal tails of stars and are now falling back together. They've been very badly disrupted and lots of new star formation has been triggered by all of the shock waves that are traveling through them, hence the red color and a lot of blue new stars. So uh, these collisions create new generations of stars. 
galaxies are everywhere there is approximately 100 to 200 billion stars in the milky way galaxy but the whole of the visible universe contains the same number again of individual galaxies another 100 to 200 billion galaxies and some of them are clustered together in these enormous uh, clusters and super clusters of galaxies and this is one such structure here where there are thousands of galaxies all so different sizes with a few giant ones in the middle there these giant elliptical galaxies but behind this cluster of galaxies in the far universe there are many more galaxies and the gravity of the nearby cluster is acting as a gravitational lens and you can see the long thin curved streaks which are the distorted images of much more distant galaxies being lensed by the uh, distortion of space-time around the mass of the foreground cluster proving again something that uh, Einstein had predicted but those galaxy clusters, they're not randomly distributed around the universe. We live where the little red dot is in one arm of an enormous network of uh, galaxies and clusters of galaxies and super clusters of galaxies that all are threaded together into this beautiful fern-like structure, which we've called Lanica Leia. Uh, and is the largest structure to have been mapped in any detail. We've mapped it particularly with the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which has been measuring the distance and direction and position and number of galaxies across the universe. Uh, the two big black sectors are where we haven't looked, but the rest of it is showing every individual dot is a galaxy or a cluster of galaxies and the color the, the more red the color the more densely packed the galaxies are but you can see it's like a web of threads linking together in 3d uh, as if it was the material of a sponge and there are the air gaps in the sponge correspond to the dark black voids where there is nothing this is a consequence of the way that gravity pulls everything together and once you get a slight over density more gravity is created because it's denser and so the dense bits get denser still but another photograph from the uh, hubble space telescope this is the hubble deep field where they stared at one patch of sky for a whole month and it contains some of the most distant objects in the universe that we're ever going to be able to see. We have some foreground stars with spikes coming out of them, but then we have galaxies and galaxies and more galaxies going off right into the background, getting smaller, fainter and redder as they get further away, redshifted by the expansion of the universe. And some of these galaxies go right back and we're looking 12 billion years back in time at the faintest galaxies in this picture. And then after that, there is nothing. The universe is 13.8 billion years old, but at 12 billion years ago, that's when the first galaxies started to form and the first stars lit up. So for just over a billion years before that, the universe was essentially dark. We call it the cosmic dark ages. And if you go back any further than that, then the only thing that you can see is the cosmic microwave background. And this has been a fantastic source of science, understanding the slight patterns, the over densities and under densities and the slight changes in temperature of this map of the heat echo of the Big Bang that I talked about in my Cosmic Dawn and Destiny lecture. And with that, we've uh, covered everything from the nearby universe uh, in the form of the moon, all the way out to as far as we can possibly see at 13.7 billion light years back into the past to the uh, heat echo of the Big Bang. And so, I'll bring that to a stop there.
and so thank you very much i hope you've all enjoyed the introduction to astronomy course and uh, 